Hello and welcome to Shrikecast. Uh, today's topic is how to set up a SonicWall firewall device from scratch uh, as if you pulled it right out of a box uh, from the factory. So you can follow along with uh, today's lesson by going to livedemo.sonicwall.com as you see here. And uh, they provide here uh, a nice interface where you can load up all of the SonicWall products and take a look at their interfaces uh, which would, uh, be, could be a great help to you as uh, I go along uh, through the interface on my Sonic wall here. Uh, if you click on launch the live demo site, bring you up to an interface where you can choose whatever Sonic wall product uh, you would like to load up. I'm going to be working on a TZ100 today. Uh, so if you click on that, it will bring up a pop-up window and present you with the interfaces if you were in a real Sonic wall firewall. And then you can use that to follow along. So let's go over to our lab environment. First thing I want to show you is that what I've done to my Sonic Wall at this point is I've pulled it out of the box and I've held in a paper clip into the reset button on the back of the Sonic Wall uh, as I plugged it in. And if you hold that reset button in for I'd say 10 seconds or so. Uh, you'll start to see the wrench light, which is up here next to the power light on the other side of the sonic wall, start to blink once on and off every second. So once it begins consistently blinking on and off, you can pull out that paper clip, and then it will be in a maintenance mode. And maintenance mode puts the sonic wall into uh, basically like a ROM mode where it's running off of a very limited operating system. So it's used basically for maintenance and recovery. Uh, so that you can get in there when things uh, go awry with the firmware that's loaded or the settings. So here we are at that screen. Uh, the Sonic will defaults to 192.168.168.168 as you see up top. Uh, that's the standard for any Sonic will device that has uh, come from factory defaults or it's in maintenance mode. We've got some basic information about the product here. We've got our product name, serial number, uh, some codes for setting up the device in our account, uh, what version we're running, basic things like that. And below we have uh, our firmware listing. Now, right now, out of the box, it only has the current firmware and the firmware factory default settings, which lets you reset the device back to its factory uh, defaults. What we're going to do is upload the new firmware, uh, the latest one that I've downloaded off of my sonicwall.com. I like to do it this way, uh, run, by running it in this maintenance mode, uh, the, safe, the safe mode they show here, and then importing the new firmware. Uh, I find it's cleaner and I run into less issues this way. Uh, basically it starts the sonicwall up in kind of a, a factory default very clean method and I like to do it this way so that's why I'm following along this, uh, in this form. What we're going to do is click on upload new firmware browse to our firmware file which I have saved on my desktop they all have uh, the same naming system where it's SonicWall, TZ, whatever the model is English, French, Chinese, whatever it might be and then the firmware version. So we're going to open that upload the file. It'll take a few seconds here and show up on our interface as a firmware that we can boot off of as we see here. So now we have an uploaded firmware and uploaded firmware with factory default settings. So what are the differences here between current firmware, current firmware with factory, uploaded firmware, uploaded firmware with factory? Basic idea is that if you choose current firmware it's going to save your settings that you had at the time. So maybe we had some settings uh, changed on the Sonic wall, we've put it into maintenance mode because we wanted to update the firmware, the built-in firmware uh, upgrade utility wasn't working, something like that. We could then upload new firmware and then boot off of that uploaded firmware without touching our settings. So it's, it's a safe way of doing that. Now what I can also do is have it boot off of its current firmware if I didn't want to upgrade the firmware. Maybe I had a problem with my settings and I put it into this maintenance mode and I said, you know what, I'm just going to blank it out, do everything over again. I'm going to boot off of my current firmware because I already have the latest version, let's just say. Uh, and then I want to go back to factory default. So I can do that and then choose boot over on the right side, which will then boot it in that blank factory default mode. 
Since I've uploaded a new version of firmware, I'm going to choose the last option, Uploaded Firmware with Factory Default Settings. There may also be other options on here. If uh, this is an older device, let's say, that's been around for a few months and someone's made a backup setting, which we'll show later, uh, it'll also show in there where you can boot off of your backup settings, uh, which is a very nice feature in case something goes wrong. So what the Sonic will do is doing now is it's booting and uh, starting up in this new uploaded firmware that I've given it. Takes it uh, 15 seconds or so to do so. Okay, and here we're presented with the first screen of a Sonic World device once it has booted from factory defaults. Uh, Sonic will provides you a, an easy setup wizard to go through and make changes if this is your first time using a uh, Sonic World device. It'll go through how to set up your local area network IP scheme, your wide area network uh, IP scheme if you're connecting to DSL or a cable modem or something like that, uh, basic security settings. What we're going to do though, since we're experts, is skip that and go to our management interface. Default login is admin and password like many other devices. And you're presented with your basic status page with all the information about your Sonic Wall. First thing I normally do is go over to the time section and set my time zone, which is useful for my log information. You don't have to set it correctly, but if not, you might have times changed. Uh, unexpectedly, so you might not be able to match things up correctly. I'll apply that. And then I'll scroll down here and I'm going to add an NTP server. I use the ntp.org pool and specifically I'm going to use the United States ones. So we're going to use us.pool.ntp.org. You can go to ntp.org and find out more information as to what pool you might want to use or you can just use pool ntp.org and it'll use any of them in the world. Uh, I like to specify United States. At that point I'll click apply just to make sure. And we're going to start right off the bat going into our firewall and locking down our firewall here. I'm going to go into advanced and we're going to turn on all of these detection prevention options here. We're going to enable stealth mode so that it uh, does not respond on any closed ports. We're going to randomize our IP ID to prevent uh, guessing our connections with uh, IP traffic. And we're going to decrement forwarded traffic to prevent uh, to help prevent loops uh, in our network if that ever arises. Uh, and also it will make it show up in trace routes. So whenever we do a trace route that's based off of the decrement of the time to live value in your packet, this way it will show up as acting as a router and uh, will show up in your trace routes. I also checked the last option, uh, which can be a security concern. If you generate ICMP time exceeded packets, then you can run into problems with that. So we're going to apply those. So now we're going to go to security services gateway antivirus and now we have our gateway antivirus displayed here we're going to enable it and I'm going to click apply just to make sure it's on and we're going to make sure that all of these here are enabled for inbound inspection on all of our protocols so I want to make sure that all of my virus scanning is done inbound on HTTP, FTP, any mail protocols I want to make sure everything that's is filtered as it comes in. That looks good. So now we're going to go down to anti-spyware. Going to enable anti-spyware. And we're going to prevent every level of spyware as well as detect. If you prevent it will keep it from damaging your system, uh, your computers that are connected to the sonic wall and protected by it it'll get catch as much as it can. It's not perfect like every other product out there. Uh, and if you choose detect, it will show it in your logs. If you don't tell it to detect, it will prevent them but not tell you about it. So I like to do both. That way if uh, something's going on, I can go into logs and I don't have to turn this on. I have a history already going on uh, in my logs as to what it's finding and stopping. 
So we're going to click apply at the top. Last thing I like to check down here uh, as well is make sure all these are enabled for inbound inspection on all the protocols and then ensure that it is inspecting outbound communications as well. So now that we've enabled our security services uh, from a global settings standpoint, we have to enable it for each zone. The, the SonicWall is a zone-based firewall. So we have to go into each zone and tell it what security services are enabled for each zone. So what we do for that is go to Network, Zones. And here you can see what zones uh, are enabled for every different security service. So the zones are listed in rows and the security services are by column and you can see that some are on by default. Uh, I usually like to adjust this, you could say. Um, client antivirus, you don't have to worry about unless you are going to be checking client antivirus with SonicWall's uh, product uh, installed as software on computers. The gateway antivirus is what we're configuring here. So what you can see is that for LAN communications the content filtering is enabled uh, to prevent inappropriate websites or harmful websites. Uh, the gateway antivirus is enabled, anti-spyware, and intrusion prevention service. It's also enabled for the WAN, and it's also enabled for our DMZ, with, but not for the additional security services such as gateway antivirus and anti-spyware. So what I want to do is, I'm going to say, maybe I have a server connected to my demilitarized zone, my DMZ, on another port, and I'm, I plan on setting that up later. What I'm going to do is go into that zone and turn on those security services for that zone. So what you have to do is you click on that pencil icon there for configure, and then we're going to enable gateway antivirus, intrusion prevention, and anti-spyware. And if we refresh the page, there we go. So now I have a few extra security services turned on. Uh, it does use up more resources on the device depending on how many options you turn on in the security services and how many security services you have turned on for every zone that you're using. But in a low uh, volume environment, like a small medium business, you're, you're probably not going to run into an issue on your processor usage on a sonic wall. I haven't run into that yet. Unless there's some uh, worm or something like that, or a virus spreading throughout your infrastructure, and it's sending a whole ton of email out of a bunch of clients, then you'll see the CPU spike uh, as it's trying to process all that traffic. Otherwise, on day-to-day -day usage, I have these turned on, almost every option turned on, on customers that have uh, 100 or less people working uh, of various models, and that never run into an issue.